Good morning. Welcome to NTD. Good morning. Here are our top stories. Homes destroyed, hundreds of thousands of acres burned, a nuclear facility shut down. Wildfires are wreaking havoc in the Texas panhandle. Former President Trump and President Biden emerge victorious from the Michigan primaries. A closer look at what the results could tell us about the November election. The nation's top lawmakers meeting the president yesterday but failed to find an agreement on government funding. A partial shutdown could be just days away. A key witness for defense attorneys seeking to disqualify Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis retakes the stand. What you need to know about Nathan Wade's divorce lawyer's testimony and the timing of the Trump prosecutor's romantic relationship. With the presidential primaries underway, popular AI chatbots are generating false information about elections that could, could mislead voters. We dig deeper into the issue with the host of NTD Business. Shen Yun Performing Arts wraps up six shows in Miami, Florida. We hear from audience members who praise the artistry of the performances. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Welcome to NTD. Welcome. Today is Wednesday, February 28th. Yeah, and the Arab population in Michigan really making their voice heard with that Listen to Michigan group accumulating about 10% of that protest vote uncommitted to President Biden. That's right, and but they don't want a Trump presidency either, though. So here is our top news. We're going to take a look at the latest results in the Michigan primaries with 99% of the vote in. Former President Trump wins the Michigan Republican primary with 68.2% of the vote, just over 755,000 votes, earning him nine delegates. Former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley coming in second with 26.5%, a little over 294,000 votes, earning her two delegates. On the Democratic side, President Biden won with over 617,000 votes. That's 81.1 percent of the vote. The victory gives Biden 86 delegates. A little over 100,000 votes went to uncommitted, which accounted for 13.3 percent of the vote. And the latest results bring Trump and Biden one step closer to a November rematch. And despite easy victories on each side, both campaigns might still have things to worry about. Joe Biden, you're fired! Trump and Biden had no trouble winning their respective primaries in Michigan on Tuesday, but the results showed that both candidates are facing challenges in their campaigns. Michigan is seen as a key battleground state and could prove pivotal in the general election. Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson said that Tuesday saw a record turnout for a presidential primary in the state. It was higher than what we saw in 2020, uh, and it was notable because it was the first time our state gave voters the option to vote early in person at a early vote center. Biden faced backlash from a section of voters for his stance on the Israel-Hamas war. Over 10 percent of voters chose uncommitted in the Democratic primary. This followed an aggressive campaign by Listen to Michigan, a group that strongly opposes U.S. support for Israel. I don't think the Democrats take us seriously, um, and they're going to they're gonna have to start if they plan to win in November. The campaign, backed by Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, exceeded their target goal of 10,000 votes many times over. For his part, Biden made no mention of the uncommitted campaign as he thanked Michigan voters for handing him another victory. On the Republican side, Trump once again finished firmly ahead of rival Nikki Haley. The former president has now swept the first five states on the GOP primary calendar. Data from AP VoteCast reveals his core voters are mostly older than 50 and generally without a college degree. That could be a warning sign for Trump, who will have to appeal to a much wider range of voters in November, especially in states like Michigan. Michigan Republicans are only awarding 16 of the state's 55 delegates based on Tuesday's results. The remaining 39 will be awarded at a March 2nd state GOP convention. And moving on, Lara Trump officially announced yesterday that she's running for co-chair of the Republican National Committee. The former president's daughter-in-law said she's proud to have the endorsement of Donald Trump. Former President Trump has been pushing to unite his campaign with the RNC ahead of the general election in November. He also endorsed North Carolina Republican Party Chair Michael Watley for the position of RNC chair. Current RNC chair Ronna McDaniel will step down early next month. The committee will hold an election on March 8th. Watley and Lara Trump are both currently running unopposed. 
The top four congressional leaders met with President Biden at the White House yesterday to discuss funding the government. Speaker Mike Johnson described the meeting as honest and in good faith, but just days before a potential shutdown, there is no clear path to an agreement. NTD's Louis Martinez has the story. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson has a crucial decision to make in the coming days in order to avoid a government shutdown. The Speaker can look for support of House Democrats in order to approve the first four appropriation bills, or he could close ranks with House Republicans in order to hold out and achieve their policy objectives. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer emphasized Tuesday that Democrats do not want a government shutdown. That we made it so clear that we can't have the shutdown because it hurts so many people in so many different ways, even for a short period of time, was very apparent in the room. And the Speaker did not reject that. And Senate Republicans share their counterparts' frustration. This is why I voted against the last CR. They've just been kicking this can down the road. I can't believe that they didn't get work done over the, over the weekend. They've had months to do this stuff. I mean, I, I, my patience has run out. Senator Rick Scott from Florida laid out a third option for the Speaker. So the only way out of this is a CR through the end of the year and then start the budget process for next year. Congressman Byron Donalds, a House Freedom Caucus member, has expressed he will not vote for further government funding until the border is secure. Other members have demanded tighter constraints over food stamp beneficiaries and FBI and IRS spending. On Tuesday, Speaker Mike Johnson summarized his objectives to the president and congressional leadership at the White House. Uh, let me say this. When I showed up today, my purpose was to express what I believe is the obvious truth, and that is that we must take care of America's needs first. Congress has until this Friday to approve the first four appropriation bills. The remaining eight are due on March 8th. And if all fails, on April 30th, the Fiscal Responsibility Act would come into effect, cutting government spending 1% across the board. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Solardo Martinez, NTD News. Joining me now to discuss President Biden's appeal to Congress for more Ukraine aid and avoiding a government shutdown is Richard Stern, director of the Grover M. Herman Center for the Federal Budget at the Heritage Foundation. He's also a former budget advisor to Congressman Mike Johnson. Richard, thank you for your time this morning. Will Congress come together and agree on a budget deal with just a few days to go before the first partial government shutdown deadline? Thank you for having me on. I, my guess is they probably will. Shutdowns are very rare in U.S. history, and usually they happen, frankly, when one or, honestly, both parties in Congress feel like they've got something strategically to gain from it. So I think reading the tea leaves on this is they're going to come to some kind of a deal. Now, I don't want to oversell it, though. My guess is that's probably going to be another CR that kicks the can just slightly down the road. Right. Yeah, that's what we heard some congressmen and some senators saying. Now, how much accountability and oversight is there for large sums of money sent to Ukraine being spent effectively, without waste? And does the U.S. have any other option to shell out all this national treasure than to do that to advance its foreign policy goals? So of the money that's being handed to Ukraine, there's actually almost no accountability whatsoever. There's almost no way to really test and track where it's going. However some portion of the aid is in-kind aid, right? So it's where we're handing them weapons, or frankly, we give them what amounts to really a gift card they can spend with Boeing or Raytheon. But I think to the core of your question, though, is there a better way to do this? You know, part of what's going on here is this money is being handed out without any kind of clear guidelines on the strategy, the goals. There are tens of thousands of Ukrainians that are being killed, frankly, because the Ukrainian government, NATO, the U.S. government, isn't attempting to do anything to lay out what the end of the war should look like. And so, you know, I think one of the concerns, certainly for conservatives looking at this, is that we're shelling out, you know, if we do what Biden's asking for, another $500 per American household that'll drive inflation, that'll drive mortgage rates even higher, with no clear sight at the end of this or clear plan on how we bring the war to an end and stop the bloodshed. I understand your concerns. President Biden obviously taking this very seriously, having visited Ukraine last year, and military analysts are saying that, you know, Russia's aggression just could spell very bad things for Ukraine here, especially without that funding. Are lawmakers talking enough about a timeline for supporting Ukraine financially? Is a series of blank checks indefinitely a viable solution? Well, I'd say I think that's the thing. A series of blank checks indefinitely, I think, is not viable for two different reasons, right? One, is fundamentally it, it promotes violence without getting uh, uh, gains on the ground. 
you know, part of what we've seen for months now, frankly, is the Ukrainian government not doing things on the battlefield that would put them in a better defensive position, frankly, overplaying their hand because of an assumption of getting federal aid that didn't come. Uh, frankly, some of it looks like they might be trying to do it to induce Congress to give them more aid. And so I think there's a tremendous disconnect between the average Ukrainian that is fighting in the front lines or whose home is in the battlefield versus the elites in Ukraine that are running the government. But then the other reason is this is money that Americans don't have to shell out for this. Mortgage rates just went back up to 7%, very much because of government spending. Inflation is still high. Grocery prices are 21% higher than when Biden took office. And it's because of these mounting deficits, which is frankly why the government shutdown is looming, right? Because there's disagreement in Congress about how to cut spending responsibly in a way that won't pull the rug out from other people, but will drive down inflationary pressures. Where would that $60 billion for Ukraine come from? Would it be an increase in taxes or just be more deficit? At the moment, it would be more deficit. And again, you know, what's happening right now is the government is eating everybody else's lunch at the buffet table. So if you want to buy a home, you want to go to school and have a student loan, you're looking to expand your small business, you're in competition with the government over that money. You know, right now, the, the deficits that the government's had over the last couple of years pushed just mortgage rates as one example, from 3% to 7%. That's an extra $350,000 on the lifetime of a mortgage just for a median home, just in interest costs. That's a result of federal deficit. So that's what we'd be talking about here. Well, Richard Stern, director of the Federal Budget Policy Center at the Heritage Foundation, thank you for your time. Thank you as always. And a series of wildfires swept across the Texas panhandle early today, prompting evacuations. The blazes also cut off power to thousands and forced the shutdown of a nuclear weapons facility. And today's Daniel Monahan has more on the fires, which have destroyed an unknown number of homes and other structures. Authorities say strong winds, dry grass, and unseasonably warm temperatures have fed the wildfires. Greenville, Texas Fire and Rescue shared this harrowing video. An emergency team driving into a hellish inferno that most would flee from. Flames line the roadside, and black smoke billows across the scorched landscape. Here the fires can be seen by air, from a plane arriving in Amarillo. The blue lights of Elk City Fire and EMS can be seen flashing as they travel along a road dotted with orange fires. Governor Greg Abbott issued a disaster declaration for 60 counties as the largest blaze, the Smokehouse Creek Fire, burned nearly 400 square miles. So far, more than 370,000 acres have been burned by the fires, according to the state's Forest Service. The main facility that assembles and disassembles America's nuclear arsenal, Pantex, had to shut down its operations Tuesday night. The plant posted on X on Wednesday that it had resumed operations. A wildfire crossed from Texas into Oklahoma, where it prompted evacuations on Tuesday. Oklahoma resident David Morris says they have been in a tornado zone and a fire zone for the last few years. You know, I'd call it climate change and global warming, but I'm not woke. It happens every year about this time. <laughs> The National Weather Service has issued red flag warnings and fire danger alerts for several other states through the midsection of the country. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. A key witness for defense attorneys seeking to disqualify Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis took the stand again yesterday. A judge rejected Terrence Bradley's claim to attorney-client privilege on Monday. Bradley is the former law partner and divorce attorney for Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. He previously told defense attorneys the Trump prosecutor's romantic relationship absolutely started before Wade was hired by Willis in 2021. Now he says he was only speculating. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more on yesterday's hearing. I do see that message, but I do not recall. Terrence Bradley said repeatedly Tuesday under oath he didn't know or couldn't remember when Willis and Wade's relationship began. Bradley testified he only remembers having one conversation with Wade about Willis during the four and a half years of representing him as a client. I can't tell you what date that was. It was made in confidence. We were in the back of our office. 
Our officers were the only two in the back. There was no one else present. Trump attorney Steve Sadow drilled down on Bradley's previous text messages to defense attorney Ashley Merchant. Sadow asked Bradley why he would speculate and not just say he didn't know when the relationship started. I have no answer for that. Except for the fact that you do in fact know when it started and you don't want to testify to that in court. Overruled. That's the best explanation, isn't it? This is a Overruled. That's the real, that's the true explanation, because you don't want to admit it in court, correct? No, I have no direct knowledge of when the relationship started. Sado asked Bradley why he corrected Merchant on where the Trump prosecutors had met in the text, but not the timeline of the relationship. I was answering the question of... She wrote magistrate court and I said no, municipal court. Judge Scott McAfee will hear closing arguments from both sides on Friday. He suggested no ruling from the bench, meaning a decision on the DA's disqualification could still be a few weeks away. The judge Tuesday said he would allow additional evidence to be referenced, including cell phone data obtained by a private investigator working for Trump's lawyers. McAfee reserved the right to reopen evidence if he feels he needs more information to make a decision after Friday's hearing. Defense attorneys claim Willis and Wade's relationship was improper and allege Willis benefited financially from the arrangement using public funds. Both refute the claims. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Hunter Biden is expected to appear for a closed-door deposition before the House panel investigating President Biden today. The First Son's legal team negotiated several terms after previously stating they would only agree to a public hearing. The private deposition is part of an impeachment inquiry led by the Oversight and Judiciary Committees. The probe is heavily focused on the younger Biden's foreign business dealings during his father's time as vice president. The deposition will not be videotaped. Both sides agreed to quickly release the transcript to avoid selective leaks. That's after a review to redact any sensitive information. The House Oversight Committee on X stated the interview is important, but not the end of its investigation, posting there are more subpoenas and more interviews to come. And amid concerns about President Biden's memory, House Republicans now using subpoena power to demand details about the special counsel's probe into the president. Biden again jokes about his age, sparking new controversy. And today's Iris Tao has more from the White House. After complaining that the Justice Department was too slow in responding to an earlier request, House Republicans on Tuesday subpoenaed the transcript and any related recordings of Special Counsel Robert Hur's interview with President Biden last year. Republicans leading the impeachment inquiry into Biden say they want to find out first whether any classified documents that President Biden may have retained are actually related to the countries that his family was allegedly dealing business with. And also they say they want to see if the Justice Department was treating Biden and Trump even handily. In addition, Republicans say they want the American public to have access to the recordings that made Special Counsel Robert Hurd to write in his report that President Biden had a, quote, poor memory. And President Biden on Monday again tried to push back against concerns about his age, saying this on NBC's Late Night with Seth Meyers. Number one, you got to take a look at the other guy. He's about as old as I am, but he can't remember his wife's name. Yeah. <laughs> Biden was referring to Trump's speech at CPAC last weekend when Trump said this. I call up my wife, our great first lady. She was a great friend. People loved her. <laughs> yeah, people love her. Oh, look at that. Wow. Mercedes, that's pretty good. But while Biden and the NBC host both noted, Mercedes? Then you can't remember your wife's name? Trump was, in fact, apparently referring to CPAC host Mercedes Schlapp, who was sitting right in front of him. And I want to thank Matt and Mercedes Schlapp, two great people, along with the entire staff. As Republicans continue to demand more details about the special counsel's report, they are seeking to keep the question about President Biden's memory in the spotlight. In just three weeks, special counsel Robert Hur is set to testify before lawmakers. And as part of Republicans' impeachment inquiry into Biden, Hunter Biden will also testify in a closed-door deposition on this Wednesday. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. Coming up, the U.S. solidifies its stance on not sending troops to Ukraine to fight against Russia. That's after the French president said he wouldn't rule out possible ground support. 
Polish farmers protest on the streets of Warsaw, demanding an end to subsidized imports from Ukraine. That's after the break. Good to have you back with us. Returning now to the Russia-Ukraine war. The Pentagon yesterday saying Washington won't send troops to the battlefield in Ukraine. The statement comes after French President Emmanuel Macron vowed to defeat Moscow without ruling out the possibility of a ground operation. We have no plans to send U.S. service members to fight in Ukraine. Uh, the, the president has been pretty clear on that, and, and that continues to be uh, our position. Macron made the statement during a crisis meeting in Paris where heads of European states were attending. Besides the U.S., the head of NATO and several NATO allies have also distanced themselves from Macron's statement, making clear that they had no intention to send troops to Ukraine. Meanwhile in Moscow, the Kremlin warned that an open conflict with NATO will be inevitable if troops were deployed. And meanwhile in the U.S., leaders in Congress hope to avert a partial governmental shutdown, but Ukraine funding is still causing a divide. To hear more, we bring in Gerard Felitti. He is a senior counsel at the Lawfare Project. Good morning, Gerard. So good to have you. Um, first, if the House Speaker should continue to refuse a vote on that, are, the, are there ways for lawmakers to support sending aid to Ukraine um, by forcing a vote on the matter? There are. The, the House can force a vote even without the Speaker putting it on the calendar, on the agenda, by essentially having 218 members of the House vote to bring it to a vote. Uh, so you would need to have a couple of Republicans crossing lines with the Democrats uh, in order to have that happen. And then, of course, you'd need the actual vote on the aid package, uh, which, again, would need at least 218 votes. All of this is possible. The hard thing is for Republicans to actually cross party lines, go against their speaker and bring this to the table without his permission. If that happens, more likely than not, people will vote for the aid bill uh, and it will go through. So let's uh, break this down a little bit. Tell me a little bit. Go, let's go into a bit more detail and tell me what you were talking about. There is this discharge petition and then there is something that's being referred to as defeating the previous question. So what are these and what, what are the difference in these and which one did you just describe? Well, I described the discharge petition, which is probably the easier way to go about doing this. Uh, and you, you file this petition, essentially, you still need a majority of votes to file that. Uh, but that makes it to the floor without getting the speaker's approval necessarily. Bills don't make it to the floor unless the speaker approves. With a discharge petition, it, it discharges the speaker's authority to stop a bill from uh, or a measure from making it to a vote, uh, essentially. Uh, and it gets a, a full vote of the House. So there you need people to cross party lines. Uh, and that is probably the more uh, the, the most efficient way to do it and the most likely way this will happen because we have seen some Republicans indicate that they do want to support uh, Ukraine funding. They do want to support uh, funding for Israel uh, outside of the budget process. Uh, so that is most likely to be the, the tool that's going to be used to get this to a full mm -hmm. vote. So it sounds like the willingness is there for some. Uh, so what does history tell us, though? Because this is not a commonly heard term. So what does history tell us about how um, likely that is to happen versus in this specific case? Because also considering that this is an election year. Well, tools like this have been used before, not infrequently in, in other Congresses. The real issue, though, is we have seen in this Congress that there is a difficulty among Republicans in, in both electing a leader and having a leader that actually stays the course. We've seen this with McCarthy. We're seeing issues with Speaker Johnson as well. So really, the party right now is this disunited, uh, which makes it harder to, to manage the caucus, essentially the conference of Republicans, uh, and get them unified behind a vote. So you do need to use parliamentary procedures like this in order to advance legislation because they're now because the the margins are so narrow we have several empty seats in congress even though we just had an, an election in new york's third district uh, where a democrat uh, took the seat from george santos previously held by george santos so the republican minority you know the the, the republican margin is a very small one and the, the democrat minority really has a lot of power uh, to to move legislation if they want to but they need just a handful of Republican votes to do so. So this, this is really the issue of this Congress, is it's kind of stuck 
because the margins of power are so small that Republicans need to really be unified. And when they're not, then you need to employ parliamentary procedures to get anything done. Mm. Thank you so much, Gerard Felitti, for breaking this down for us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Israel and Hamas have been negotiating a new ceasefire proposal to release the hostages in the Gaza Strip. NTD's Jason Perry has the details. Qatar is currently mediating ceasefire talks between Israel and Hamas, though the two sides are not meeting in person. On Tuesday, a spokesman for Qatar's foreign ministry gave an update. If there was an agreement, you'd see me here in a more uh, cheer uh, attitude. But, uh, but till now, we don't have an agreement, yes, and we are still working on the uh, negotiations. An Israeli government spokesperson on Tuesday said the Israeli military will keep the pressure on Hamas while the talks are ongoing. Um, because we know that the one thing that works against Hamas is, is the combination of military pressure and diplomatic pressure. Um, that's what uh, has led to the uh, framework that we saw back in, in November that saw the release of more than 100 hostages. Hamas is now reportedly reviewing the ceasefire proposal proposal, while residents in the Gaza Strip are ready for a deal to be reached. Over a million people are now residing in the city of Rafah, where Israel said the fighting will soon take place if Hamas does not release the hostages by Ramadan. We hope for a permanent ceasefire so we can go back to our places. It's true there are no houses, but we hope to go back to our places. Also on Tuesday, Israel's prime minister responded to President Biden's remarks about Israel losing international support for its war against Hamas. Today, the Harvard-Harris poll was published in the United States, which shows that 82 percent of the American public supports Israel. Netanyahu said that gives Israel another year of strength to continue the campaign until victory. Jason Perry, NTD News. Stay with us. What do Americans think is the biggest problem facing the country? A new poll reveals which issue came out on top over inflation and the government. And a new measure to address shoplifting in the Big Apple. New York City takes defensive steps against retail theft after Governor Kathy Hochul proposed a $45 million bill to do the same. Good to have you back. The top two Senate Republicans are calling on the chamber to proceed to an impeachment trial against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. This after the House approved two impeachment articles against Mayorkas over his handling of border security. Minority Whip John Toon said Tuesday that people need to be held accountable for the crisis at the southern border. And Minority Leader Mitch McConnell says a full Senate trial would be the best way forward. Democrats who control the Senate have the power to dismiss the impeachment articles with a simple majority vote. The House voted to impeach Mayorkas earlier this month, accusing the top Biden official of willful refusal to enforce immigration and border security laws. And a new Gallup poll found immigration the top issue for voters for the first time since 2019. Over a quarter of those surveyed said immigration is the most important problem facing the country today. Republicans make up most of the 28 percent that said immigration. Close to 60 percent of GOP voters said it was the top issue, up from 40 percent in Gallup survey last month. Government was the second biggest problem among voters polled. 20 percent said it was the most important to them. Other big issues were the economy in general and inflation. Government held the top spot as most important issue in Gallup's poll for most of last year. And immigration and customs enforcement agents in Boston have arrested a 34-year-old illegal immigrant convicted of child sexual assault. The Guatemalan national had been released by a court in Massachusetts despite having an immigration detainer filed. The man who was not named had unlawfully entered the country 13 years ago. Officers issued the detainer for him at Essex County House of Correction, where he was being held following his December arrest. Despite this, the court released him back into the community. And in Virginia, authorities arrested another illegal immigrant for sexual assault of a minor. The 32-year-old from Venezuela was apprehended last week on felony charges for a sexual assault that allegedly took place in January. 
A 14-year-old girl was the victim. Officials say Renzo Mendoza Montes was in the country illegally after being detained and released by Customs and Border Patrol in September 2023. New York City is taking defensive steps against retail theft. Councilman Oswald Feliz is proposing a new measure to address shoplifting in the Big Apple. This after New York Governor Kathy Hochul proposed a $45 million bill to do the same. NTD's Chris Beers has the latest on the councilman's plan. New York City Councilman Oswald Feliz is set to propose a bill today that would give cash to small retailers and grocers like this one behind me to pay for things like surveillance cameras, plexiglass shields and panic buttons to help them deal with the problem of retail theft. What impact would this have on the problem? Um, right now, security guards are $50 an hour. Um, panic buttons would be great because it, it increases um, police response time. We have all had to uh, increase our security in stores. A lot of supermarket operators are looking into AI to, you know, as a preventative measure. Um, so yes, tax credits would be greatly appreciated. A recent Council on Criminal Justice report said that New York City saw an increase of 64 percent in reported incidents of retail theft between 2019 and 2023. Here's what New Yorkers have to say about the problem. The DA and the court system, they need to you know, set an example of people that are doing that. And maybe if they start actually taking action and putting these people in jail, then some of it would stop. Thank you, sir. Law enforcement here in New York, uh, from my experience, it works way different than, uh, uh, than the rest of the country. I don't see that in the rest of the country. In like the East Harlem Target, you know, they completely okay. closed down and shut up shop because of all the retail theft. And, you know, as these things kind of persist, we're going to start seeing the consequences of these larger businesses moving out. In Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis says retail theft incidents have decreased by 30 percent. He recently proposed a plan to strengthen penalties for retail theft perpetrators. How does his plan compare to New York City Council's? Much more support of the direction Governor DeSantis is going in, uh, because I think that will deter people from, from stealing this. They know they're going to, if they get arrested, they may serve time. Uh, they'll be less likely to do so as opposed to what's happening now is they steal whenever they want, whatever they want, and they know that there's not, no price to pay. What's next with this bill? Well, there'll be a public hearing and then a committee meeting. Then the committee will vote on it, and if it passes that vote, the full council will have a final vote. This is NTD's Chris Beers reporting in New York City. Up next, with presidential primaries underway across the U.S., popular chatbots are generating false and misleading information that threatens to disenfranchise voters, according to a report yesterday. And Macy's announced it's closing 150 stores nationwide. What's behind the decline of department stores? NTD business host Don Ma will provide analysis after the break. Welcome back. And joining us now is NTD business host Don Ma to give us the latest update from the business world. Don, what's going on with AI? Okay, so yeah, that's one of the things I actually wanted to talk to you about uh, because this is an election year and there's some misinformation relating to that topic. And as well as I wanted to talk to you about how consumers are feeling about the economy. And also I think that is uh, important as well when it comes to who they want to vote for their next president. So according to a report published yesterday based on the findings of artificial intelligence experts and a bipartisan group of election officials, Popular chatbots in the U.S. are generating false and misleading information. And because of that, voters could be disenfranchised with uh, presidential primaries underway and next week uh, being Super Tuesday. So it appears that millions of people are already turning to artificial intelligence powered chatbots uh, for basic information. So that's information including about how their voting process works. Uh, so now the report actually found that uh, chatbots like GPT or Google Gemini are prone to suggesting voters uh, heading to places that actually don't exist or they're actually inventing illogical responses uh, based on rehashed and dated information and the chatbots uh, simply are not ready for prime time it seems like at least uh, when it comes to giving important and nuanced information about elections right yeah i think it's important to know that chatbots operate on sometimes they're not updated all the time with the newest information i think chat gpt is 
Um, I think it's programmed with information from 2023, April or something like ChatGPT4 that is. So um, can you give us an example of how this would, you know, how this would show what kind of answers, responses were given? Yeah, sure. That's very important. So five models were actually tested in this research. Uh, so that, of course, includes ChatGPT and Meta's Google, uh, Meta's Lambda 2 and Google's Gemini and two others. Uh, so they all failed to varying degrees when asked to respond uh, to public que basic questions mm -hmm. about the democratic process. And uh, let me just give you an example here. So when participants asked the chatbots where to vote in a specific zip code in Northwest Philadelphia, Gemini responded that there's no voting precinct in the United States for that zip code, which actually is false information. Um, and another example is, uh, so in, in Nevada, where same-day voting registration uh, has been allowed since 2019, uh, four of the five chatbots tested asserted incorrectly that is uh, voters will be blocked from registering to vote weeks before Election Day. And I think most people uh, would actually double-check that information, but mm -hmm. it seems like this research uh, just hammers home that fact uh, as well for uh, for people who is using chatbots for basic information like this. And I think uh, this research uh, is something that uh, consumers or uh, uh, potential voters should uh, keep in mind. Yeah, that false information from AI in Nevada really scared the Secretary of State there. Let's move on. How are consumers feeling about the economy before the election? Right. So, yeah, that's also another very important topic to discuss here. Um, so, well, consumer sentiment uh, is always evolving, right? So it, it could be different when uh, the election, election actually comes around. But right now, it seems like consumers are feeling less confident this month. So the business research group, uh, the conference board, said yesterday that its consumer confidence index fell. And this drop means that Americans feel uh, slightly worse about the current economic conditions and the outlook for the next six months as well. And at the same time, Americans' short-term expectations uh, for income, for example, business and the job market fell as well. And it's at a level that is often associated with a recession. Now, that doesn't mean a recession is on the horizon, but that's just a point to keep in mind. And the decline in consumer confidence this month comes as uh, somewhat of a surprise because the economy continues to look resilient, at least on the official data front. Um, so if you look at that, there's potentially no need for consumers to feel this way, but official data could be uh, slightly different than how we actually feel about the economy. But the good news is that Americans uh, were slightly less worried about food and gas prices last month. And the conference board uh, said that uh, this uh, could be potentially uh, the silver lining here. Mm. Well, it seems like the consumer, dec the confidence decline is really showing, especially when you look at Macy's, who has been closing more stores, or at least they had announced that they had to close more stores, right? What was the problem there? Yeah, uh, that, that was uh, kind of a big announcement by Macy's yesterday. It said that it's closing 150 stores, and this is about a third of its total uh, stores and closures are the result of decades of decline in the department store industry. Macy's problems stem from big box retailer competition and a shift to online shopping is another problem. Also, activist shareholders are fighting for control of the company's board. Another crucial problem is the retail industry has split in two. Uh, that means brands like Walmart uh, that focus on cheaper items are succeeding. Uh, so are luxury brands for people who still have means to afford finer items. But department stores uh, focused on the middle class are fading. Macy's uh, said the restructuring is an effort to shift more resources to its more successful and upscale brands uh, such as Bloomingdale's. Just the next step. I mean, last month, Macy's announced that it was laying off about three and a half percent of its workforce. That's over 2,300 employees. But Macy's is not the only thing that's going down. Google is down in market value as well. Is there a reason for that? Yes, uh, there was actually something about that yesterday. Uh, so. Google's parent company Alphabet lost more than $70 billion in market value in a day after its problem with Gemini AI image creation tool. Uh, the tool refused to create images of white people, it seems like, and displayed many historically or racially gender based incorrect images. This problem has led to a pause of Gen Gemini. Investors uh, are now worried Google might not actually be a good source uh, of AI here. 
Right. Even the CEO was then saying that really offended its users. So let's uh, let's switch topic here for topics here for a moment. What's going on with Wendy's? What do consumers have to customers have to brace for there? Yeah, yeah. Let me just quickly uh, brief you guys on that as well. So Wendy's will begin testing a price surging model uh, in its restaurants starting in 2025. Now, surge pricing is a strategy uh, of altering prices based on demand. It's a concept already used by ticket sellers and ride sharing companies. So Wendy's CEO, Kirk Tanner said the company will also use AI enabled menu changes and suggestive selling. He hopes a franchisee interest in digital menu boards will increase, uh, further supporting sales and profit growth across the system. So it seems like this move is just uh, a slight bet here that uh, this model will help profit just a little bit more. That's interesting. Yeah, USA Today says that that dynamic pricing isn't new in the business world, but it's becoming no the norm now. So Don Ma, host of NTD Business. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, an NTD documentary explores how the Chinese Communist Party influences storylines in Hollywood movies, plus reactions from audience members after the film's premiere. And Shen Yun Performing Arts wraps up six shows in Miami, Florida. We hear from theater goers, including a beauty pageant winner who praised the artistry of the performance. Stay tuned for that and more after the break. Good to have you back. Hollywood movies need the approval of the Chinese Communist Party before they can play in China. This often involves rewriting key aspects of the movie to fit the CCP's liking. But it doesn't stop there. China's control in the American film industry goes way beyond this. This is explored in a new documentary by NTD called Hollywood Takeover. The film debuted over the weekend at the Conservative Political Action Conference. Let's take a look at reactions from audience members after the screening. It was outstanding and very enlightening. So this documentary brings to light how influential the CCP and the um, uh, obscene amounts of money that are the impetus for Hollywood to, um, to betray all of the uh, best about this country. I love it. Anything that brings out truth, I'm all about. We uh, um, in America are, are starved for truth, even though we have the ability to, to have access to a lot of knowledge, we are just very ignorant of what's really going on in the war, in the, in the world. And so uh, we just really appreciate it, Epic Times to doing what they've done. To me, a movie should be made. It's like Nick Sears, he said he had a movie he was making, and he's like, I'm not going to change the script because that's what the artist had intended. So to change it, to have the regime of China, the CCP, any totalitarian government control art, it is exactly what Hitler did. People need to watch the Hollywood takeover. I think it will educate them, it will inform them, and they need to quit listening to the lies of the mainstream media on this stuff. Hollywood Takeover China's Control in the Film Industry premieres on Epic TV on March 8th. Well, you remember when the Taiwanese flag was taken off of Tom Cruise's jacket and Top yeah. Gun, and then they brought it back after all that controversy. Right, made big news, and that's really good to know, you know, like things things people might not think twice about, because it's entertainment. It doesn't necessarily have to anything to do with politics, and that this is brought out, that how they have their tentacles in almost everything nowadays. Yeah, pop Very culture, movies have so much influence yeah. on our political views and everything. Right. All right, moving on, Shen Yun Performing Arts brought 5,000 years of traditional Chinese culture to the stage in Miami, Florida last week. And the audience was the winner of Miss Global USA, who described Shen Yun as not something you get to experience every day here in America. Classical Chinese dance company Shen Yun has successfully lowered the final curtain on six performances in Miami, Florida. The company combines classical Chinese dance and music 
telling stories of ancient Chinese culture from before communism. I thought that the choreography and that the timing and the placement of between video and live performance was just amazing. It was cool to see cultures come together in that way. I thought it was a truly interesting way to celebrate not only Western culture, but also Eastern, and especially through the music. Uh, I've never seen some of those instruments before, so it was very cool to see. I'm most impressed with the professionalism, a high level of artistry. Um, and a sense of uh, mission and a vision, something very specific, very specific message of the timelessness of Chinese culture. The New York-based company has a mission to revive 5,000 years of China's rich culture rooted in spirituality. That's the whole point why we're here on Earth, to help heal the collective with everything that we do, and I believe this dance represents that. So spirituality is very important to me, and it spoke to me the whole, even just the beginning, that we're all here for, uh, for mission work for the creator. So, and, and everything, even the dance moves, are just so aligned so well with the message. I would say come here for a cultural experience. It's absolutely beautiful, the art, the costuming, and the, the performance here, the talent that we see here is not something that you get to experience every day here in America. So definitely go out and see the Shen Yun performance. Shen Yun is headed to St. Louis, Missouri for three performances at the Stiefel Theater on March 2nd and 3rd. And you talk about the CCP trying to control Hollywood. Well, they just recently admitted that they were trying to block Shen Yun from playing in South Korea. Exactly. So that makes us even, right, especially in light of the previous segment, that makes us appreciate that even more. The beauty of artistic freedom in this country. Yes. All right. Stay tuned for just one minute. We'll be right back. NTD News, the fastest growing independent news source in America, bringing you breaking news from around the world. Expert analysis, investigative reporting, and original award-winning documentaries. We're known for our uncensored China coverage you won't find anywhere else. We cover the stories that affect you and shape our world without the political noise. We report from the heart with you in mind. Watch us right here on NTD News. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. Good morning. Here are our top stories. Former President Trump and President Biden emerged victorious from the Michigan primaries. We take a closer look at what the results could mean for the November election. And how are Trump's legal issues affecting his campaign? We speak with a senior advisor to the former president to find out. Homes destroyed, hundreds of thousands of acres burned, a nuclear facility shut down. Wildfires are wreaking havoc in the Texas Panhandle. A key witness for defense attorneys seeking to disqualify Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis retakes the stand. What you need to know about Nathan Wade's divorce lawyer's testimony on the timing of the Trump prosecutor's romantic relationship. Free and Equal Elections Foundation is hosting a presidential debate with candidates from various third-party organizations. We sit down with the founder for more information. A New York City medical school will be tuition-free for all students after receiving a $1 billion donation. More on the donor and the school's reaction. The Odysseus moon lander is sending back some final lunar photos before it shuts down. The spacecraft's mission is ending prematurely after landing on its side. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Welcome to NTD. Good morning, everyone. Today is Wednesday, February 28th. Today's top news, a series of wildfires swept across the Texas panhandle early today, prompting evacuations. The blazes also cut off power to thousands and forced the shutdown of a nuclear weapons facility. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on the fires, which have destroyed an unknown number of homes and other structures. Authorities say strong winds, dry grass, and unseasonably warm temperatures have fed the wildfires. Greenville, Texas Fire and Rescue shared this harrowing video. An emergency team driving into a hellish inferno that most would flee from. Flames line the roadside, and black smoke billows across the scorched landscape. 
Here the fires can be seen by air, from a plane arriving in Amarillo. The blue lights of Elk City Fire and EMS can be seen flashing as they travel along a road dotted with orange fires. Governor Greg Abbott issued a disaster declaration for 60 counties as the largest blaze, the Smokehouse Creek Fire, burned nearly 400 square miles. So far, more than 370,000 acres have been burned by the fires, according to the state's Forest Service. The main facility that assembles and disassembles America's nuclear arsenal, Pantex, had to shut down its operations Tuesday night. The plant posted on X on Wednesday that it had resumed operations. A wildfire crossed from Texas into Oklahoma, where it prompted evacuations on Tuesday. Oklahoma resident David Morris says they have been in a tornado zone and a fire zone for the last few years. You know, I'd call it climate change and global warming, but I'm not woke. It happens every year about this time. <laughs> The National Weather Service has issued red flag warnings and fire danger alerts for several other states through the midsection of the country. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. And now we take a look at the latest results in the Michigan primaries with 99% of the vote in. Former President Trump wins the Michigan Republican primary with 68.2% of the vote, just over 755,000 votes, earning him nine delegates. Former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley coming in second with 26.5%, a little over 294,000 votes, earning her two delegates. On the Democratic side, President Biden won with over 617,000 votes. That's 81.1 percent of the vote. The victory gives Biden 86 delegates. A little over 100,000 votes went to uncommitted, which accounted for 13.3 percent of the vote. And the latest results bring Trump and Biden one step closer to a November rematch. Despite easy victories on each side, both campaigns might still have things to worry about. Joe Biden, you're fired! Trump and Biden had no trouble winning their respective primaries in Michigan on Tuesday, but the results showed that both candidates are facing challenges in their campaigns. Michigan is seen as a key battleground state and could prove pivotal in the general election. Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson said that Tuesday saw a record turnout for a presidential primary in the state. It was higher than what we saw in 2020, uh, and it was notable because it was the first time our state gave voters the option to vote early in person at a early vote center. Biden faced backlash from a section of voters for his stance on the Israel-Hamas war. Over 10 percent of voters chose uncommitted in the Democratic primary. This followed an aggressive campaign by Listen to Michigan, a group that strongly opposes U.S. support for Israel. I don't think the Democrats take us seriously, um, and they're going to they're gonna have to start if they plan to win in November. The campaign, backed by Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, exceeded their target goal of 10,000 votes many times over. For his part, Biden made no mention of the uncommitted campaign, as he thanked Michigan voters for handing him another victory. On the Republican side, Trump once again finished firmly ahead of rival Nikki Haley. The former president has now swept the first five states on the GOP primary calendar. Data from AP VoteCast reveals his core voters are mostly older than 50 and generally without a college degree. That could be a warning sign for Trump, who will have to appeal to a much wider range of voters in November, especially in states like Michigan. Michigan Republicans are only awarding 16 of the state's 55 delegates based on Tuesday's results. The remaining 39 will be awarded at a March 2nd state GOP convention. Lara Trump officially announced yesterday that she's running for co-chair of the Republican National Committee. The former president's daughter-in-law said she's proud to have the endorsement of Donald Trump. Former President Trump has been pushing to unite his campaign with the RNC ahead of the general election in November. He also endorsed North Carolina Republican Party Chair Michael Watley for the position of RNC chair. Current RNC chair Ronna McDaniel will step down early next month. The committee will hold an election on March 8th. Watley and Laura Trump are both currently running unopposed. And let's get an update on former President Trump's strategy ahead of a likely rematch against President Biden and how legal fees are affecting his campaign. Here's some of my talk with Lynn Patton, a senior advisor for Trump 2024. Well, you know, the Democrats understand that they can't beat President Trump on, on their agenda, so they're trying to beat him in the courtroom. Um, you know, it's a textbook case of election interference. 
Their goal is to break him emotionally, break him politically, break him financially, and also break him uh, to the point of, of just uh, morale, because, you know, they're indicting not just him, but the people around him, his top executives, his top advisors, so that it gets to the point where nobody wants to work for this man, and he's left destitute with nothing and nobody. But the American people are waking up to that, and they're recognizing in droves that this is not what this country is about. And it's the irony, of course, of ironies, is that Democrats claim to be the ones fighting for democracy, but yet they're also filing lawsuits to remove him from the ballot. And almost 16 states were winning those lawsuits in droves at the state Supreme Court level and also at the Supreme Court level. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, yes, you know, his legal fees are distracting from the campaign agenda and what we are obviously uh, dedicated to doing. And the only way to battle that is to raise money, which we've been doing in droves as well, uh, because the American people don't like it. Right, and Lynn, that is a huge impact with the Associated Press reporting that over $76 million has been spent over the last two years by his campaign and other fundraising programs that he has there. Biden touted over 350,000 jobs gained in January and also a low unemployment rate of about 4%. How is Trump going to make his case that the economy was better under him? Well, that's easy. Uh, Donald Trump did have the strongest economy in over 60 years. Joe Biden has actually the highest inflation in U.S. history. And it doesn't count as creating jobs when people are actually just finally going back to their jobs post-pandemic and also post-inflation. Uh, you know, when the cost of living has quadrupled under percent, that's not success. You know, mortgage rates, the average family is spending an extra $19,000 a year in mortgage, over $11,000 a year in rent groceries, gas, that's not success, you know. Um, when you create jobs, but then increase the cost of living, that's the worst kind of, 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 of job uh, creation, because at the end of the day, everything costs more. So working is something that most people have to do. And by the way, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of those numbers are because people are getting second jobs, third jobs, fourth jobs. Lynn, as President Biden and President Trump plan to visit the border, a poll shows that a majority of Americans now do support building a border wall between the United States and Mexico. So what is President Trump's strategy here going forward? I'd like to remind your, your viewers that, uh, you know, the Democrats shut down the government for the longest period in history when Trump asked for just $6 billion to build the southern border wall. They've now since sent over $170 billion to Ukraine since that war started two years ago. And they shut the government down, loss of jobs, loss of wages for the longest boycott in history, government shutdown in history. State bank, state parks were closed. Uh, federal government employees had to go on assistance. During that time, it exceeded almost uh, a month and a half, I believe, almost two months long. Uh, just because they didn't want to give my boss six billion dollars to basically do what they recognize now should have been done a long time ago. Lynn Patton, senior advisor for Trump 2024. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. Coming up, we sit down with the founder of Free and Equal Elections Foundation to talk about their upcoming presidential debate with candidates from various third party organizations. And a New York City medical school receives a $1 billion donation. What this means for the students going forward. Moonlander Odysseus sent back photos of the moon before it runs out of power. See images from the first U.S. lunar landing in over 50 years. Hi, so welcome back. Uh, we have here to tell us about tomorrow's presidential debate among third party candidates and some potentially big name independents like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is Christina Tobin. She's the founder of the Free and Equal Elections Foundation. Christina, thank you for joining us this morning. 
Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's really great to have you. And let's continue our conversation here that we were having because I'm really interested to hear about uh, some of the issues that you're seeing. Because on your website, you say you're focused on transforming the American election system. And we know that uh, the desire for a third party, for instance, is on the rise. So I'm interested to hear about more about the issues that you're seeing and the idea behind organizing these debates. Uh, yes, Free and Equal Elections, I founded it 15 years ago, knowing there'd come a time in history where there'd be more independent voters than there are Democrats and Republicans. So we're here to unite candidates across the political spectrum, more voices, more choices, and through conversation. And when we're cordial and kind to one another, uh, respect one another, I feel that we can bring about solutions. There's no problems, only solutions. Mm -hmm. And you just have such a lineup. I mean, you got Jill Stein from the Green Party, Chase Oliver, Libertarian, another Libertarian, and also others too. Why is it important to hold these debates that feature candidates outside the mainstream two-party system in the U.S. and hear from a diverse range of voices? I think we and most of your viewers can agree that the current people, the two parties, really one party, is controlled by military industrial complex, pharmaceutical powers that be. And we need really individual candidates that are not uh, tied to big money that really represent we the people to win. So here at Free and Equal Elections, we foresee our presidential debate series this year. We've been hosting them for 15 years. Larry King was a co-moderator back in 2012, wow. reaching tens of millions. And uh, bringing these candidates together, they need an independent platform to win, not only for president this year, but in, for Congress in 2026. There's a much bigger vision building here at Free and Equal Elections. Right, and talking about that, I saw that you invited Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Any news on whether he will attend? I am actually been hired. I have a petitioning company as well. It's gathered millions of signatures for 25 years to get cancer on the ballot. Did it for Ralph Nader in 08, uh, very left-leaning independent. And I have been recently hired my petition company, Free and Equal Inc., by Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s Super PAC, American Value. So he's been invited. I still hope he can make it. Uh, but we'll have another debate after the primary, and I'm confident he'll be at that one. <laughs> that's it. a big name. Yeah, that's yes. definitely going to add a lot a to man. that discussion. Right, so now the House has agreed to a resolution last February denouncing the horrors of socialism, citing that it leads to famine and the killing of over 100 million people. Claudia De La Cruz, she's a candidate running with the Socialist Party. She's a confirmed attendee at your debate. Do you think it's important to give socialists a voice? Definitely, all for more voices and more choices. In order for a peaceful movement to rise, I think it's important, very important, for us to respect each other's viewpoints, no matter how vastly different, even if we disagree. At our debates, we use a cumulative format, which is uh, created by the League of Women Voters, to engage conversation where candidates respect one another's ideas. So yes, we are truly all inclusive, that free and equal. Right, open discourse, that's important. Correct. So, and some would argue that nowadays, you know, people that vote, people that actually participate in um, in politics are often politically charged. They're polarized on either side of the two sides of the spectrum. Actually, so Catherine Jell and Michael Porter published an interesting um, uh, paper on this. So how do you think your debates or le debates like your ones can encourage more people or you, uh, the middle maybe to come out to participate more? I personally know Catherine and I know of Michael and many electoral experts like that we bring to free and equal elections. And so with uh, their, your, the end of your question there was exactly? How do you, how does your, uh, the debate that you were organized, how would that help with bringing the middle out more? Oh, definitely. We're going to be building a coalition around the presidential debate series. So up to six debates this year, we are gearing up already for our second debate. This is February 29th at the Chelsea Television Studios, the home of Jon Stewart. I'll be sitting behind his desk. And so uh, this debate series will help bring in individuals like Catherine and many electoral uh, coalitions, organizations, leader to build around a much bigger movement, which will break out to the United We Stand tour. You can go to my website, our website, freeandequal.org for more information to sign up uh, to get on our email list and to support and donate because it's the people that have powered this movement. Well, it's great that we have something set in stone here, real debates, because there are some general election debates scheduled for September and October, but it's just unclear if any Democrat or Republican will attend. Next, what reforms are needed surrounding election technology? Oh, we actually, 330,000 votes were casted to vote in the top seven candidates for our presidential debate February 29th, tomorrow at the Chelsea Television Studios from 8 to 9, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern. It'll be broadcast live at freenickel.org, uh, Rumble, and other media outlets. So um, we definitely uh, see blockchain technology as a, a, what will transform our elections and bring about political transparency. To have the people vote in seven candidates is amazing. And then we're also going to have a poll after the debate tomorrow where people can vote ranked choice voting because we need alternative voting methods. Uh, there's a lot of different 
certain reforms for electoral reform beyond blockchain technology. Well, such an interesting topic and very complex. So I really appreciate your time this morning to come in. Uh, Christina Tobin, the founder of the Free and Equal Elections Foundation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christina. Thank you, and thank you to NTD News. Appreciate it. A key witness for defense attorneys seeking to disqualify Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis took the stand again yesterday. A judge rejected Terrence Bradley's claim to attorney-client privilege on Monday. Bradley is the former law partner and divorce attorney for Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. He previously told defense attorneys the Trump prosecutor's romantic relationship absolutely started before Wade was hired by Willis in 2021. Now he says he was only speculating. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has more on yesterday's hearing. I do see that message, but I do not recall. Terrence Bradley said repeatedly Tuesday under oath he didn't know or couldn't remember when Willis and Wade's relationship began. Bradley testified he only remembers having one conversation with Wade about Willis during the four and a half years of representing him as a client. I can't tell you what date that was. It was made in confidence. We were in the back of our office. Our offices were the only two in the back. There was no one else present. Trump attorney Steve Sadow drilled down on Bradley's previous text messages to defense attorney Ashley Merchant. Sadow asked Bradley why he would speculate and not just say he didn't know when the relationship started. I have no answer for that. Except for the fact that you do in fact know when it started and you don't want to testify to that in court. Overruled. That's the best explanation, isn't it? This is completely Overruled. That's the real, that's the true explanation, because you don't want to admit it in court, correct? No, I have no direct knowledge of when the relationship started. Sado asked Bradley why he corrected Merchant on where the Trump prosecutors had met in the text, but not the timeline of the relationship. I was answering the question of... She wrote magistrate court, and I said no, municipal court. Judge Scott McAfee will hear closing arguments from both sides on Friday. He suggested no ruling from the bench, meaning a decision on the DA's disqualification could still be a few weeks away. The judge Tuesday said he would allow additional evidence to be referenced, including cell phone data obtained by a private investigator working for Trump's lawyers. McAfee reserved the right to reopen evidence if he feels he needs more information to make a decision after Friday's hearing. Defense attorneys claim Willis and Wade's relationship was improper and allege Willis benefited financially from the arrangement using public funds. Both refute the claims. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. After a decade of development, Apple has reportedly canceled its electric car project, according to multiple sources. The 10-year-long effort was considered one of the company's most ambitious projects. Apple reportedly announced the decision yesterday to teams working on the vehicle called Project Titan. Hundreds of employees will be shifted to divisions working on artificial intelligence, according to Bloomberg News. High interest rates have led to a slowdown in demand for usually pricier electric vehicles. Some staff members are expected to be laid off, but it's unclear how many will be affected. Industry analysts say Apple was still many years away from ever releasing its own car. The tech giant never officially announced it was working on the EV project, and it also hasn't confirmed the cancellation. The Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City will be tuition-free for all students from now on, thanks to a $1 billion donation. The donation came from Ruth Gottesman, a former professor and widow of a Wall Street investor. The 93-year-old has been affiliated with the college for 55 years and is the chairperson of its board of trustees. The gift is intended to attract a diverse pool of applicants who otherwise might not have the means to attend. College administrators said it'll also let students graduate without debt. The donor credited her late husband, David Sandy Gottesman, for leaving her with the financial means to bestow such a gift. She announced the decision to students and faculty Monday. It brought some in the audience to tears and others to their feet cheering. And a private moon lander managed to beam back more pictures with only hours left before it dies. Last week, the Odysseus, carrying experiments for NASA, made the first U.S. touchdown on the moon in over 50 years. 
The spacecraft landed on its side, hampering communication and power generation. When sunlight can no longer reach the lander's solar panels, operations will stop. Intuitive Machines, the company behind the lander, expects that to happen no later than today. The latest images beam back to Earth show the moon's unexplored south polar region. NASA plans to land astronauts there in the next few years. They paid Intuitive Machines $118 million to deliver six experiments to the surface. Other customers also had items on board. Despite its slanted landing, Intuitive Machines became the first private business to land on the moon. Another U.S. company gave it a try last month, but didn't make it there because of a fuel leak. Since the 1960s, only the U.S., Russia, China, India and Japan have had successful moon landings. Only the U.S. has done it with crews. Well, That's tough stuff. Yeah, but it sounds like despite it uh, not going as long as planned, it was really, it's a, it sounds like it was very successful. Yeah, they got something out of it. I mean, that is rocket science after all. For sure. <laughs> all right, we have to wrap up our show now, but we'll keep you updated with the latest information. Stay tuned for our News Today broadcast at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan.